Uh, welcome to San Diego Design Week, a genesis of change, environmental design, and the challenge to our coastal lands, presented by Kim, and it should say the Library Foundation SD, because uh, we're hosting the event. So uh, I'm Scott, I work for Library Foundation SD, and I run the library shop, which is about 50, 60 feet that way. We are a nonprofit book and gift shop. All of the proceeds support the San Diego Public Library. And uh, today we have uh, Kim's book, Waves and Beaches, for sale in the shop and in the back of the room here. Uh, Kim, the author, will sign everything we sell. Faye, what are you waving at? Oh, oh you're showing where the book is. That's a great idea. So Faye back there has the book. All the proceeds will support the library. It's $30, it's a beautiful book. We'll tell you a lot more about it as the event gets going here. Um, but please, uh, all the proceeds support the library. Speaking of the library, uh, this is a beautiful space, the Neil Morgan Auditorium. So let's get started here. So San Diego Design Week. So a great set of events. There's still one more day. If you go to the Design Week website, there's still plenty of exciting programming. But Kim and I have talked about doing this event for a while. The pandemic kind of got in the way. Uh, in 20, did your book come out in 2020? 2021. 2021, probably the worst time ever to publish anything, right? Because the world was turned upside down. Uh, Kim put together a revised edition of William Baskin's Waves and Beaches. So this for decades has been the source uh, for information about our coastal areas, our tides, the way waves work. It's a fascinating book. Patagonia uh, got together with them and released this. It's like a beautiful coffee table edition. It's got all sorts of new illustrations that Kim put together. It is an amazing work. He updated it. He wrote some new uh, stuff. A lot of that will be in the presentation today. Uh, so he'll give his presentation, and then afterwards we'll be joined by our panel. So let me introduce who's going to be coming up later. So first, our moderator is going to be Mackenzie Elmer. She's the environment and energy reporter for Voice of San Diego. She's reported on coastal erosion issues in the North County and has extensively covered the impacts of pollution and contamination in the Tijuana River Steery. So Mackenzie Elmer, she'll be leading our discussion after Kim's presentation. And then we have Serge Tadina, PhD. Or, He's or, the executive or, or. director of Wild Coast an international conservation team that conserves coastal and marine ecosystems, wildlife, and addresses climate change through natural solutions. He's also, though he's here on his day off, so this is an unofficial visit, he's also serving the second term of the mayor of Imperial Beach, his hometown. So, Serge, thank you for being here today uh, to discuss this important topic. And then finally, we have our presenter today. A good friend of mine, I'm really excited that we're finally able to do an event to, uh, to focus on his book. Kim McCoy is an oceanographer and adventurer who has been seduced by beaches and observed waves on all seven continents. His ocean research began when the land and sea merge with surf zone wave dynamics and continues today with the coastal effects of climate change. McCoy was presented with the Scientific Achievement Award in 2018 for his work as a principal scientist with NATO in Italy. In March of 2021, McCoy published a beautifully revised edition of the classic work in the field, William Bascombe's Waves and Beaches. So please join me in welcoming physical oceanographer, not a metaphorical or a metaphysical, a physical oceanographer, Kim McCoy for San Diego Design Week. Please. Provided smart water for today's event because of the high level of talent here today. <laughs> okay, let's see here. Where are we? All right, so um, are we getting in the mood, kind of? Waves. So this this book, as Scott mentioned, uh, was published. First in 1964 by Willard Bascom, and then again in 1980 by Doubleday. And it was used during the Cold War simultaneously by the Soviet Naval Academy and the US Naval Academy. Just to give you a little bit of 
idea of how broadly accepted it was. It was translated in several languages. So I met Willard Maskin first in the late 90s, although I had used his first edition in graduate school. So I'll read a little bit from the preface and then we'll go into a presentation. It should last a little over uh, about 25 minutes. So the sun's heat still creates the winds which transform into waves until dying in turbulence upon the shore. However, our measurements and interactions with the waves have all changed. The numbers of surfers, divers, kayakers, sailors, and people living in the coastal areas have increased immensely. The size of ships and the number of offshore structures have grown into a web of international commerce that influences all humans. These changes now affect our urban planning, large-scale funding, political decision-making, all upon an undeniably rising sea level and changing climate. But still, by understanding the origin of coastal dynamics, societies can anticipate coastal changes and respond to those changes in support of the well-being of their members. This edition of Ways and Beaches will help you take action and is in part why I became involved with its writing. Get your little intro there of why I might be standing here. So, here we go. It is a 20 year storm and those 4,300 units are gonna have major problems, but we're still permitting things and that needs to change because if you're putting things in a watershed, it's only time before they are removed by nature. So this gets a little bit technical here. This is uh, the opening of an estuary. So this is a plain view. So this is water here, this is the ocean. And as the tide goes up, it pushes water into the estuary. As the tide goes down, it pushes water out. But it also pushes sediment in, and if there's a river flow into it, which there usually is, that's uh, an estuary is basically where fresh water and salt water have agreed to a treaty, and they say, okay, you can do this for high tides, and I'll do that at low tides. And so you ch if you change the, the opening here, and here's a ratio here, this is entrance area section, which is this here, in relationship to the tidal prism, which is how much volume is going up and down during the tide, you have a healthy relationship. And that's described by this line. So if you if you if you go one side or the other, you get either deposition, like you're getting at the Penasquitos, or you can get erosion. So it's a it's it's not a simple thing, and the balance is very subtle. So at the Tijuana Estuary, we have sort of four outcomes. Here we are today in the center. And so if we have more extreme river flow events, so it rains in the Tijuana River shed, we get more water coming down, we get lots of sediment. If we have fewer river flow events, we get less. And so we can have two scenarios. We can have Lake Tijuana, which is lots of water, or we can have the mouth opens up of the estuary and then it just becomes a big lake. You know, it's, it's, um, it, it's a difficult situation because if we don't know what the weather is going to be. We just know it's changing. And on the other extreme is, okay, it's just going to turn into a salt marsh. And uh, so short-term solutions have long-term liabilities. So what is done there is really important. General backing up a little bit. So upstream watersheds replace sediment losses as waves and tides determine our coast. It will affect what's happening down in Imperial Beach. So you see what this massive watershed in comparison to that small Tijuana River opening. And the sediment goes north. That's pretty much what makes the Silver Strand and uh, Coronado. So you change the dynamic here, and lots of things start happening, not least of which is Imperial Beach disappears. At the coast, fresh water and salt water mix continually, and when you pump fresh water out, what happens is it lowers the water table, and salt water says, oh, cool, I can go in that direction. So it goes in that direction, and it spoils the aquifer. 
So that water is used for drinking, it's used for irrigation, growing crops, and if those things change, the amount of people living in an area is, is, is changing, the amount of <coughs> crops that can be grown changes. So further upstream, if it rains differently, you're going to have different influx of salt water, of fresh water into the salt water system. So why do waves matter? A wave of climate change because the ice is changing in the liquid water, the liquid water is changing in water vapor. It's changing the whole water system, the hydrology, how things flow on, where where rains fall, how much atmospheric uh, water vapor there is, and of course how much ice. I mean, the ice is a very visual thing, but it's hard to see. Oh, how much water vapor is there in this room? It's a very hard thing to see. But as it increases, that's one of the reasons why we're getting these changes in the Earth's atmosphere. It's becoming unstable. So you can view this as a, a wave. This is the sometimes called the jet stream. It's certain polar, and there's one in the South Pole also. So when you have strong gradients, so when the air in the North is really cold and the air in the south is really warm, there's a strong gradient and things sort of stay in balance. It's like, you guys stay there and I'll stay here. In to the Sahara, across the Atlantic, pushing more water vapor and heat. It heats the water, which did like the sea, did not warm. So you have things that happen in the coastal zone that are not just the storm surges, but they're also the water that comes down. So the water and the storm surge and the, and the heavy rains meet at the coast and it's disaster. So there's also waves of weather in biology. That was great. All right, now to the Q&A portion, discussion se section of our talk. I know when I'm in the audience, I always have some kind of burning question and I want the moderator to provide some time for us to ask from the audience. So I know you guys have questions. We have a preeminent wave and beach specialist with us. So now is the time to ask and I'll cue you for shouting out a question. But um, I guess I wanted to start by just talking about uh, Willard Baskin a little bit, who wrote the first few editions of this book. And um, I think even you use this book uh, as a student, didn't yes, you? Yes, as I a did. student, yeah. You, um, maybe you need a mic too. If you don't mind, that. you have two up here to share. So, um, and so he was an explorer and a geologist. This should be working, I think. Hello. Yep. Yeah. Hello. So he was an explorer and a geologist, and yeah. he even developed technology to. I think he dug the deepest into the Earth's crust. And yeah, he was uh, responsible for Project Moho with a lot of other scientists in the late 50s and early 60s. Yeah, he developed deep sea drilling technology, right? Yeah, he, he, well, he, if you've ever heard of dynamic positioning, Willard Baskin invented that, as well as recommended to Bradner, Hugh Bradner, I think it was, to use neoprene for the wetsuit. Yeah, so, um, so then you became friends and, and sort of started to write uh, this third edition together. But what my point is, is I think the second edition was written in 1964. So you had the monumental task of sort of modernizing it. And I kind of wanted you to talk about how you modernized this book uh, for this third edition. Uh, yeah, so the first edition was 64, and the second edition was 1980. So everything in this book that is after 1980, actually 79 is when the writing stopped, is my offering to Willard's, Willard Baskin's uh, history. And there was no mention of climate change. There was no mention of sea level rise. There was no mention of pipelines and hydrocarbons and wars that come about because of entities disputing over where the energy is going to come from. And mind you, this was published in March of 2021 before Ukraine happened. So Bassing was a, a pretty, it was pretty much a Renaissance man. He loved poetry. All sorts of things. 
Yeah, so I just, the point is that you had to put in a lot more about climate change and how that would affect sea level rise and what the wave energies and how that would affect the coastal um, erosion around the world, right? I just yeah, I, I don't really know the number, but I, I would estimate that 40% of this book was new topics and, you know, merged, merged words. That was actually the hardest part of doing the third edition was since I have such great respect for Willard Bascom, was keeping his style, keeping in mind what I would think he would be doing in the 21st century if he was still alive. Um, and so we're here for SD Design Week, and so we're talking kind of about designing cities in the face of climate change, in the face of rising sea levels and coastal erosion. So I kind of wanted to turn to Mayor Dedina. You've been mayor for eight years of Imperial Beach. Um, and uh, I think your term ends in December, right? Yep. Um, but your city lies sort of low, um, whereas a lot of the coast in San Diego kind of rises up on these cliffs, right, that are eroding out of the sea. But Imperial Beach sort of sits low, um, right next to the ocean. Um, and not only does it face the region's biggest pollution problem, as we know, from the Tijuana River, which we can talk about more, but also the effects of sea level rise, right? Like, in the wintertime, you face these things called king tide, which maybe you can explain a little further um, in a moment, but there's videos of those waves now reaching deep into the city. Um, so I was just curious, you know, what is a city like Imperial Beach to do in the face of these sort of climate change effects from sea level rise? Well, yeah, no, great question. So Imperial Beach, I'm sure all of you have been to the coolest blue collar beach town on the California coast, the south end of the county. Um, our city touches the U.S.-Mexico border, surrounded obviously on the west by the Pacific Ocean, um, the south the Tijuana River, the Tijuana Estuary, a National Wildlife Refuge, State Marine Conservation Area, uh, a NOAA Estuarine Research Reserve, um, California State Park, uh, there's a county regional park uh, east of in the, of the valley, and then obviously we have San Diego Bay on the, on the north end of the city, uh, it's a National Wildlife Refuge, um, and then to the east is the Otai River, right? So we've got water coming at us from all sides. First, I just want to thank Kim and Mackenzie. I work very close with Mackenzie. We're on the phone a lot talking about, and she's done a great job of just talking about all the nuances of all kinds of things to do with the Tijuana River and other coastal issues in San Diego. But I, I really want to thank Kim for just engaging me in this. I would happen to be on his book launch. And uh, I, I first had this book uh, in high school. My uh, teacher, Jim Knox, who's an early member of the Surfrider Foundation. We helped start a breakwater project in Ivy with Doug Inman was involved in, the great coastal geomorphologist and script. So I think you studied I worked with Doug. Yeah, so legend. Yeah. So to be involved with this book, and I'm like, are you kidding? I have an original paperback. I got a, a bookstore downtown. So anyway, really important book in my life. But more important, what I want to say about Kim, and it relates to how I be handling this. When you work with scientists who either at Scripps or got their PhDs at Scripps, they're unabashedly enthusiastic about science, applying science, working with people, and being in the field. And it's a joy to be with these great scientists who are in our city, right, or talking about things. And I just love this presentation, love the book, so I wanted to thank you for that, Kim. If you want enthusiasm, go meet Bob Guzik. Yeah, no, well, I can say, so we work with Bob Guzik. So here I am, before I get elected to the mayor, and there's this guy walking around and bare, barefoot on the beach in Imperial Beach doing transects with, um, uh, what I was turning she said UCLA, and I'll take it in a second. But anyway, a group of postdocs, and they're looking when we have this coastal flooding. And they're looking at, they're writing, they're writing very advanced scientific papers on sort of modeling coastal flooding. Um, and I could explain it, but my son's doing his master's in coastal engineering in the Netherlands in Delft. And so he used some of those papers. But anyway, the point is, we've got a great body of research done by really great scientists from Scripps looking at this issue. Then we got Mark Merrifield at the Center for Climate Change at Scripps, then doing the applied science. They put a buoy offshore in Imperial Beach. We can actually, and they're doing applied, like this forecasting for flooding by beach, like, like he, Mark can let us know, you know, on December 12th, King Tide, you're gonna see this much flooding at this beach end at this time on this day. And like, literally, they nailed it, right? It's been really exciting to have that information. Number two, um, then 
scientists, uh, engineers at San Diego State and Scripps, Mark's team at Scripps got another grant, National Science Foundation grant, to look at subsurface life. That's the thing that freaked me out because, you know, we, we're, we're a salt flat, essentially, and so what's happening is water is coming at us from the Otay River and the Tijuana River, and, there's all, and they're measuring subsurface life. So all that's happening. So it's been really important to have these world-class scientists working on applied problem solving with us. And then I just wanted to say, you know, I think what's been important to talk about pet mosquitoes, probably some of the world's most advanced wetland and natural climate solutions work, really working with nature, has gone on in San Diego County. You think about some of the applied science, the amazing, really ingenious restoration project in San Diego Lagoon, if you've seen that, pet mosquitoes, uh, wild coasts is working with mosquitoes with agencies in San Diego, and obviously South San Diego Bay and the Tijuana Estuary, where 70% of the tidal prisons have been filled in, by the way. Crazy stuff from all the sediment coming in 70% of the top tech you want to Yeah, it's devastating. So I, I, I wanted to say that that's been the context for Imperial Beach. And a lot of times we get the regulatory process doesn't necessarily help because the focus has to be on infrastructure and doing smart things to redesign what we have, move it away from the coast, like the, the train tracks, right? And then do things like working on dune restoration, wetland restoration, and figure out how we're going to work with nature instead of against it. So that's where we're leaving the city. Unfortunately, I think our agencies aren't set up to deal with the radical change we're seeing. And so the regulatory framework and the legal framework is good for slowing things down. But what we need is to accelerate working with nature and getting these projects going. If they take 20 years to get the permitting, that's why we do it. And, and one little comment, if you remember the slide where the sea level rise, it's been stable for 4,000 years. So in the big picture, you know, civilizations have developed because things have been so stable. Now things are changing like they've never, in, since humans have been around, it's never changed as rapidly as it's changing now. So just saying, oh, we're gonna build a seawall here, we're gonna, is not going to be enough. You know, 400 feet of sea level rise, that's happened before. It's not gonna happen in any of our lifetimes, but 10, 20, 30 feet is completely possible before the last human disappears. I, I wanted so, to ask you a question about that slide because yeah. I, I didn't really understand it, but your measurements were in meters. Well, I had two, two of them. The, the red one was in feet. Okay, the four hundred feet. one with the meters. So Sorry? you go back like 24,000? 24,000 years ago. Right, so how was sea level measured for that slide? Oh, okay, good question. Um, so there's sort of four ways that they measure global climate and sea level. There's, not to get too technical here, but coral reefs, uh, there's a oxygen isotope uh, relationship. They look at uh, dendritic, they look at um, tree rings, they look at weather patterns. They look also at sediments in the ocean. And from that, you can infer what was going on at what level at what time. And this is not just a couple of measurements. There's thousands and thousands of measurements around the entire world. It's indisputable that that's Very how clever. it was. Yeah. So I guess I wanted to just press on this point. You know, We have coastal development right on the edge of falling off a cliff, basically, especially in North County. We have it right along the beach in Imperial Beach. So when is it, you know, when do we have to move back or should we move back or, you know, when is, the, is it up to local governments to direct that policy of what's called managed retreat and climate change policy? Well, in, in Ways and Beaches, in this edition, there's a little vignette called the Pitfalls of Coastal Development. And in that, I draw a big blanket and then go, you know, fine scale. Basically, it's a feeding frenzy of funding to build things with, with permitting. It's, you know, it's obvious that it's a good thing for municipalities and governments to have additional funds, okay? But unfortunately, they permit things without thinking of long-term repercussions, and bonds are issued, and construction's great, and people get new houses, and that's wonderful until things change. So stepping back and looking at things in a longer term, like Serge is talking about, is extremely important changing the social norm 
at governance is probably the hardest thing because stopping permitting is not a very popular subject. So if you follow the intricacies of coastal adaptation and sea level rise and coastal flooding issues in California, you've probably seen a lot of issues come out with Del Mar and Imperial Beach. You may not have around what's called managed retreat, moving back. So, so, and I'm going to tell you a little story. What happened in, with the Coast California Coast Convention, we have to do these local coastal plan updates that talk about how we're going to address sea level rise. Unfortunately, I think the focus became on private residences rather than the issue of infrastructure and what actual cities and governments could do. That correlates also with a lot of us who grew up on the beach assume that everyone knows about the El Nino floods and the storms in the 1980s. Most people who probably live on the beach, a lot of folks have bought homes. You can imagine some of the wealthiest people in the world that can buy you know, a $35 million home at, at, at Bird Rock. Um, they may have set two or three homes. They haven't seen that flooding. We haven't seen that kind of flooding in a long time in San Diego. That are up, so this whole issue of like the focus on managed retreat and focusing on private property owners created this firestorm for cities like IB and Del Mar that sort of inhibited our efforts to actually address things like infrastructure, train tracks, uh, water mains, sewer lines, electrical substations. And so Imperial Beach really took a step back to really to let our residents know we're not going to move anybody's house. No one's going to get picked out of their house. We are going to focus on the bayfront, you know, dealing with wetland restoration and infrastructure and adaptation measures that don't involve private property owners. And we are going to deal with the issue of how we're going to address infrastructure on Seacoast Drive and all the other things that we have to do. And if we had money to do that right now, which we should have had money when it was zero percent interest rates, we would have done it in, in two years. We would have taken care of everything because that's what cities are good at is doing infrastructure. We're not supposed to getting more than private property owners. So you may not understand that context. I think the big picture for me in California is focus on infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Take care of the natural climate solutions work. Let's do the wetland restoration work, watershed management, doing restoration. Let's figure out how to deal with all these bridges and freeways and a flow is happening all over the state. Let's focus on that. I think there's been an effort on that um, in, from Sacramento. Uh, I think the funding has been delayed because it was because of the pandemic. There should be more money now. So hopefully that answers the question. But we've been really focused on practical things you can do to do coastal adaptation work and trying to avoid firestorms of political fights that actually get us bogged down in meetings rather than actually doing real things that help us adapt the coast. Um, did anyone have a question in the audience at all? Oh, there's quite a few. Okay, um, I saw you in the back first. Can you shout it? <laughs> yeah, I can't hear anything, so we're, I can't hear oh, anything. Oh, okay, we're not going to shout, I guess. We're going to hit the microphone. Scott has a mic. One of the awesome things about San Diego Public Library budget is we can only afford two wireless mics. So. <laughs> <laughs> Question for Serge. Um, I love Imperial Beach, and as a landscape architect here in San Diego, I'm very interested in green infrastructure. Are there any forms of green infrastructure that are being employed in Imperial Beach right now or could be effectively employed to help with flooding and doing restoration and wetland protection? Yeah, look, I, let this give credit to the folks that you want to estuary as a National Austrian Research Reserve. It's sort of like a lab. You know, that, that goes back to even Joyce Zedler, who was at San Diego State of New Georgia. She was a, she's a wetland ecologist, botanist. She's at Wisconsin now. Um, guru, sort of wetland ecologist. She had a research lab in the, in the Tijuana Estuary. There's been a lot of history of sort of natural climate solutions and wetland restoration the Tijuana estuary that obviously can't keep pace with all the sediment flows, you know, freshwater flows, all the changes that have happened. But that's been a great start to see that, that kind of intersection between green infrastructure and then um, the wetland restoration. But we just, we're doing that now in Imperial Beach. So we redid our uh, Imperial Beach Boulevard. Everything we do now is because of stormwater and doing bioswales uh, in places. You know, all that you have permeable concrete so you can absorb more stormwater. It's fascinating to see all these new infrastructure projects. Really, really cool intersection of infrastructure improvement, stormwater sort of adaptation, but also green infrastructure. And the same thing on San Diego Bay, where it really has been under the radar, but we got posted on the governor's page on, sea level, on climate change and sea level rise. The work on South San Diego Bay is globally important, innovative, really interesting work where Fish and Wildlife Service 
Port of San Diego, California Coast Conservancy, Coastal Commission, City of Imperial Beach, if I'm missing other agencies, have really done a great job of looking at restoration projects, but also we got redevelopment money to do old buildings and on the bayfront, there's a really uh, underserved area, 30% of our kids in that area live in poverty. It's, a, it's, a, you know, it's, a, it's not good. Some of the condition of those neighborhoods is changing, but it, it is, a, you know, the bayfront and South Bay is forgotten. But we're doing bioswales, you know, turning old vacant land into sort of like transitional coastal habitat and parkland accessible to the public. So what you're seeing is a renaissance and really good thinking on infrastructure improvement, economic development that pushes, goes back beyond the sea level rise, 100 years sea level rise zone, as well as opening up to public access. And that's the kind of projects you can see, you should be seeing all over California, whether it's in Oakland, East Bay, South San Diego Bay, at, you know, Los, in Los Angeles, Long Beach, that's the opportunity and where we're gonna have to make these big investments because that's where the port infrastructure is, that's where a lot of our you know, power grid is, you, you name it. So I'm very excited, I could talk for a long time about that, but I'll stop. <laughs> um, but I uh, add one more question, but I want to follow up on that. I, so beach widths is a big problem here, right? We have narrowing at beaches um, all along the coast in San Diego. Um, and you know, a lot of, well, some environmental advocates are saying, yeah, that's because we don't allow the cliffs to fall to create a beach. I know that your book touches on that. Um, so how do we balance um, designing, uh, sorry, one more example, in North County to kind of address some of this there, fighting over whether they should build jetties into the water um, to catch sand, to mining the beach and all this sort of hard infrastructure. So how do you balance this you know, natural coastline building by allowing the cliffs to fall and then what kinds of hard infrastructure should go in place to aid in that? Uh, good question. There, I'll give two extreme answers. One is if you live in the Netherlands, you're country and government has agreed that they're going to spend a bunch of money to do shore protection. And then these massive works, the biggest one is called Delta Works, and it's to protect the entire coastline and most of the, I think it's 40% of the Netherlands is below sea level. So we have this national policy that approaches it that way. What's happening here locally, Encinitas used to have some more streets actually to the west. Um, there's some old city documents that show property values and um, tax spaces, but they don't exist anymore because the cliff is eroded. Unfortunately, what we have is from Dana Point down to La Jolla, excuse me, about 40% of the coast is armored, which means some way of retaining, uh, keeping the, the cliff from eroding. And what that does is it starves the sand and when you have that, if you build a groin, build a jetty, or, you're going to catch the sand, but the people that own the property, in this case, south, because the sand flows generically south along the coast there, that starved. So you're going to have erosion on the back side, and you're going to have deposition in the front side. And if you don't have enough sand, you don't have enough sand. So the main problem is you don't have enough sand. <laughs> so. You know, readjusting if you, you know, if you put it, if the city builds a groin just south of your property, you're going to be happy because you're going to have a little beach there. But if you're, it's just north of your property, you're, you're not going to have your property much longer. You're going to lose the property rights because the tidal, so the high, high water, low, low water, generically, determines what, where the property ends and federal law comes in, it gets complex. But I don't think there's an easy solution for the, I'll call it Southern California bite because there's so much armoring going on. And until we let massive storms that perhaps we'll get that push a lot of sediment through, and if the dams aren't there, the sediment will make, make it down. But if there's dams there, all that sediment ends up behind the dam and the beaches still start. So it's a, I don't see any solution. And I think Bob Guzer agrees. The only way that it's gonna happen is you're gonna have to keep doing beach nourishment or you're gonna have, a, have to have a a national approach like the Dutch do. That's yeah, and beach nourishment because I didn't know what that meant. It sounds like we're feeding beach nutritious food. It's just adding more sand to the beach manually by taking out a lagoon or something like that. So yeah, that, a dredge that pulls it out and pushes it out. Yeah, typically. yeah. Um, and then question. There's a question in the back or the front. Yes, you're yes. the hat. 
And Kim, just I want to do the, uh, the slide where you had Del Mar. Oh, no, it's okay. Don't get it. Don't, don't. Just I'm referring to the slide you had, the, the Del Mar Beach needed sand, and then there's a sand mine on the other side of the road. That's right. it's like a metaphor for human foibles of civilization to me. Hey, it's all, we're all schizophrenic. Right? <laughs> At least most of me. <laughs> We've talked a lot about solutions, and I just wanted to make a comment. Um, I've been here a little over 40 years in San Diego, and I've watched the continual schism between physical oceanographers and people in cities and working on infrastructure, and those of us that are biologists. And sadly, what I've observed is that the biology is an afterthought. After there is damage to an ecosystem, then we start saying, oh, we need to restore. That's a word that's been used a lot today, is restoration. I mean, Imperial Beach was lucky that back in the 70s, because of the possible extinction of Clapper Rails, Ridgeway uh, Rails, we, we got some national funding. But usually, the biologists are used as an afterthought or as a uh, obstacle to overcome. We have an environmental uh, evaluation done, an impact study that's usually viewed as, oh, how can we correct this because it's in the way of development. So I'd like to see perhaps more thinking right now that we have to uh, restore or we have to find a solution to the problems that we've created. But if we thought 40 years ago, which a lot of people did think, you know, if you disturb this ecosystem, not only are you going to disturb the animals and the plants and everything, but you're ultimately going to have a problem for human beings. And we still continue to issue these permits. I mean, some of us remember when there were cows in Mission Valley and the shopping centers promised that they would not come back to the city for funding because of flooding, because they were building in a flood zone for the river. But yet every year they get money, our tax money, to mitigate the flooding that they knew that those of us said is going to happen. So I'm saying right now it's important, everything you're talking about is vital and important. But what are we also doing now to involve biologists in the initial stages to say 40 years from now you're going to have a continuing problem. Thank you very much for that comment. Yes. Did you have a follow-up comment to that? Well, this is a slide up here that I didn't include because I had to keep it to 25 minutes, but I could talk for a whole hour on this one slide. And the physical oceanographers are intimately involved in the biogeochemical cycles and we all have our disciplines. And luckily there's better understanding. Back to the permitting process, the election cycles are very short compared to biological and geological cycles. And certainly very short in comparison to sea rise, sea level rise. So get people elected that pay attention to the long-term problems with long-term solutions. Because if we don't, we're all gonna die. Like like in, in Lawrence of Arabia, you know, they're going across the desert and, and uh, the one guy says to Lawrence, he says, in front of us is the desert. No water until the other side. If the cows die, we die. Yeah, I, I just want to say, I'm, I'm actually really bullish on, on restoration. I'm going to give some practical examples. I, I get it. You know, I, I, think, I think we're seeing a lot more advanced types of projects, integrated projects with, you know, the focus really at the end of the day, for example, Pond 20 at the south end of the National Wildlife Refuge in South San Diego Bay, it's 80 acres under ownership of the Port of San Diego. Um, they have an MOU with the city of San Diego and the city of Imperial Beach to restore that. They're going to get mitigation credits from the Poseidon plan and Heinz and that fell apart, so we still have to work on that. But the idea is that it's going to be restored to full endangered species sort of habitat. Um, and if you've seen the restoration that's gone on in the south end of the bay, if you haven't seen it, please do it. It's 
remarkable to see how the minute they turned open water into marshland, the Fish and Wildlife Service got that going, um, the birds just started coming out, right? So it's been really remarkable to see that restoration. I'm really bullish on what Audubon, they're big friends of ours at Wild Coast, with rewilding Mission Bay and it's a Kendall Frost Marsh for ABCSD as well. I think the idea of <laughs> getting some more natural features into Mission Bay is brilliant. Let's rewild all of Mission Bay and do as much as we can in San Diego Bay. I, I'm really a big fan of what's going on in, in uh, San Diego Lagoon. I think there's been a lot of great restoration there. I just visited the, up, the upper phase two of that project. And then Wild Coast is the organization I run. We're doing very focused, getting rid of invasives and putting in very specific list of endemic, you know, native species that also helps sequester carbon. I think the folks at Salk Institute are doing some great research on that. So I'd say that we're really just in the incipient stages of integrating natural climate solutions, what we call blue carbon, sort of carbon sequestering, carbon storage, sort of uh, restoration type work, but also enhancing uh, species, uh, ecosystems or species. And you know what you're seeing with rewilding? It doesn't matter if it's Europe or the forests of Poland or here in San Diego. When you build it, the wildlife come. It's really, you know, and it, but, and it really takes great biologists to work with ecologists and the physical oceanographers to define those systems. So they do work for fish, people, and, uh, and wildlife and plants. So anyway. And we're a bit over our time, but if we had just one last question up front, I think we could, if you guys want to stay a little bit longer. We're in no hurry, so yeah. maybe <laughs> Scott is. Thanks for taking my question. Sure. Um, I make science documentaries for outlets like PBS and Smithsonian Channel, and I'm wondering how do each of you wish that entertainment media would talk about topics like sea level rise? Um, and I'm interested in each of your perspectives as a scientist, as a journalist, as a public official, and um, activist. Are we being recorded right now? <laughs> no. I had to ask. Um, what do you want to start with that, Kim? Go for it. Go for it. I mean, how, how do we? How do, how do I, as a media per person, wish that media was addressing sea level rise? I guess it's great that you're doing, you know, long form video work on it because I think the visual aspect of showing, you know, of climate change is really important. I mean, there's a comment about. Uh, that Kim made about the you know, elect leaders who have this sort of long-term perspective on climate change. Well, an election, or I'm sorry, a elected position, their term is usually only four years or eight years. Um, and so it's really hard, I think, for elected leaders sometimes to be able to get the political clout to make those decisions that are gonna stick long-term, right? I mean, city of San Diego right now, they passed a very long uh, climate action plan, uh, net zero by 2035. But they have to actually, you know, stick some um, some of those like deadlines on some of those actions that they want to make, and that takes a lot of, you know, political risk to have to say, no, we're gonna, um, you know, move move development back to this position on the beach or something like that. Um, so, I guess I would just say continue to do what you're doing and, and showing videos like the King Tides and Imperial Beach that show them sweeping into the city. I mean, that's a very visual aspect. Otherwise, I think people uh, need to share. So, yep. yeah. you, you look, I, what we learned in Imperial Beach talking about getting stuck in this managed retreat vortex that was, you know, took us away from coastal adaptation and was, you know, hugely allowed us to really realize how you communicate climate change. First, humans aren't adapted to talk about things that are going to happen in 5,000 years, let alone tomorrow. So, I think the coastal flooding, we do a lot of media around coastal flooding. And we don't talk about sea level rise, we talk about coastal flooding. Overwhelmingly, people can rally around that, they can see it. Some guys deny it. Don't ask people I've known my whole life, whatever. But um, it's all of the above. And I think what we learned in those meetings is having a meeting with 150 people is an absolute waste of time. If you're having a meeting on something like sea level rise or climate change with more than 10 people, you're wasting your time. You have to have small, intimate meetings, to have deep conversation with people, it takes time. And I told the head of um, Jack Ainsworth, the head of the Coastal Commission, so we, we, we need to learn how to communicate better. And it's painstakingly deep work that takes time because people don't think long term. Most of us don't. And, you know, that's just how we are. So, anyway. Yeah, this slide 
is not the way to communicate to the general public. <laughs> this slide is the nerd approach. Unfortunately, we don't respond intellectually to these things. Most of us, it's a visceral response. So what Serge was saying about show the flooding, show these things and bypass the emotionally charged things, the politically charged terms, and just show what's happening. Because most people will believe it when you show you know, Imperial Beach during a king tide. And those things are pretty predictable. You know, it's just astronomical movement, movement of the sun and the moon and the, and the earth about each other that creates king tides that are very predictable. So these things, not only can you anticipate them, you can say, look, this is going to be occurring. And then you go and document it. And those sorts of responses are, are the way to get at people. Just a little vignette with what happened with uh, um, an approach to global warming and greenhouse gases. There was about 30 years of studies. Dun Hansen, I think is the guy's name. And he said, we published, it took us 10 years to write this paper and we've written it and they publish it and it, you know, it's like, oh, all the scientists go, oh, wow, that's really good research and all that. And then, for lack of a better term, the climate denier entities write one really well-written PR piece and it negates 30 years of research and 10 years of writing the paper. So getting that visceral response is much more important than showing a slide like this. Okay, I think. Uh, well, I think we have time for one more question. Okay. And those of you who've been to an event here at the Library Foundation and the library know that I asked the last question. But we, we uh, Serge, I promised Serge would be out of here by 2.30, but we, uh, if we had a quick question, Serge, did you want to do a quick one? And then I'll so Kim, on your, one of your slides there, you uh, mentioned uh, Mission Valley and their recent approval of the Riverwalk, and uh, it sounds like you're fairly critical of it. So I'm curious the specifics of what you uh, opposed about it. And certainly, I'd love to hear your comments as an elected official. Um, had this maybe been Imperial Beach, how you might have addressed it differently, the approval of that project. My, my response to River Walk is not one of massive data other than myself going to conferences down in Mission Valley and having to turn around because it was flooded. <laughs> now some parts of that area is higher, but as long as the upper reaches of the San Diego River watershed are being influenced substantially by human building and, and uh, influencing the runoff, we will have a storm, maybe not in my lifetime, but certainly in the lifetime of those buildings, and it'll take out a lot. And it's just simply too low. I'm sure not all of the 4,300 structures are too low, but there's certainly a lot of the stuff, the infrastructure that is being built that is too low for the river drainage. Do you want that? <laughs> oh, no, you said you want That's fine. That's fine. No, okay. I, just, I, I was just, uh, I, I guess, you know, those kind of decisions are political, which I think you uh, large move for increased housing in San Diego. And I think, Kim, what you're saying is that should be law enforcement first. Well, there's a lot of money involved. You know, it's, there's a lot of money involved. You know, what's, you know, Surge and the Mexican government, they're ecstatic about $400 million being spent on that problem. The river walk is $4 billion and it'll be done before the estuary is done. It lets you know where the energy is being put. It's being put in places that will generate jobs, generate houses, tax uh, revenues, and all sorts of other things to churn the economy, okay? At what point is growth too much? There's a very good book written by Václav Smil, S-M-I-L, called Growth. Read it. There are limits to growth. In ecosystems, like the woman uh, in the back mentioned earlier, and there are limits to the physical world. And if we deny those existences, 
we're just in for long-term problems that are just cost taxpayers more money in the long term. I was going to say there's also a height limit to coastal development west of the five in San Diego, so that's another limit. Like, except for UCSD. Right. <laughs> <laughs> um, right. Thank, thank you, everybody, for being here. This is the most brain power we've ever put on the new Morgan stage in once. So thank you guys for doing such an amazing job. I do want to remind you on your way out. Uh, we have books for sale. Kim will sign anything you buy. You're welcome to hang out and, and continue the discussion with us. Get your parking validated on the way out. It's inside the lobby at the information desk. There's a tower. It'll scan. you get your two hours free. Thank you for coming to Design Week. The last question is a super easy softball. Since we are inside a public library, how have public libraries impacted your lives? So just one by one. Oh, you laugh. Everyone has an answer to this question. I am eternally grateful for libraries. My wife right here, who helped a lot on the book, Marianne, <coughs> recognizes when I go, oh, I want to go to that library. And it happens all over the world. It started when I was about nine years old. I lived on the Monterey Peninsula. And because of domestic issues, my safe refuge has always been a library. I will go into a library when I have extra time and go, oh, there's a library. Oh, I'll go pop it and look. So it's been extremely instrumental, not only in my well-being, mental well-being, I don't know if it's still there, but um, <laughs> certainly in my interest in oceanography was spawned in the Monterey Library and also going to Cannon Road. I go, oh, let me read about this. Oh, there's John Steinbeck. Oh, he's a local. Oh, well, I'll read that. So the library is completely merged with my being. For me as a journalist, I mean, we actually still do use libraries. Yes, it's not all just the internet. In fact, I had to use a, I had to research something and there was a, I couldn't buy this book. I needed this book so bad. It was a border topic, actually. And it only existed in the top floor of the library in the special collections section. So I had to sit there and copy the entire book so I had this information that I could not get anywhere else. Um, and I will also say I'm grateful the library bookshop is why I'm here. I went to go find a gift for my friend who was graduating from her oceanography PhD. And I was going to buy this for her, but then I fell in love with it. <laughs> <laughs> I kept it for myself and got her something else. But um, Scott and I, we met over this book, and so that's why I'm, I'm here on the stand today with, uh, with these two gentlemen. So I love librarians. You know, my parents are immigrants, and uh, they both escaped the war in Europe and uh, took advantage of every free and cheap thing in America. So I grew up in LA and in, in Imperial Beach, and in the library, literally. The library is a huge, huge deal. Uh, from my master's thesis on the history of Tijuana River Valley, it used the California room, the archives in the California rooms. They still exist here. They were used to be in the old library. Amazing collections, right? Um, and then my proudest achievement uh, as mayor is we worked with the county, thanks to Supervisor Greg Cox, and building, re rebuilding a beautiful, gorgeous, and you've seen an ocean themed library in Imperial Beach. It's our county library. It's the best library in San Diego by far. It's beautiful. Slow, slow your own search. <laughs> Not even, it's super cool, and so uh, I go there all the time. And I have the Libby app, so I got through the pandemic with the Libby app, and yeah, I can get Japanese surf magazines and uh, South African surf magazines and Ski Canada magazines. So I'm all in the library. In a very short vignette, uh, a lot of my university time was spent in Kiel, Germany, 54 degrees north latitude, and on top of the building was the library, and it had this big glass opening with a like a wonderful group of green plants that you never saw for about seven months. So I lived on top of the library for months at a time because my little tiny abode was freezing and it was much nicer in the library. <laughs> Great way to end it. Much nicer in the library. Thank you for coming. Thank you for the great panel. Oh, that's cool. I was going to do that.